Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you once again, the lotus feet of their lordships. And I'll be speaking today on this very emotionally riveting section from the Srimad Bhagavatam, where the theme that is the highlight of the Bhagavatam is being brought about. The Bhagavatam is essentially a devotional text and the mood of the devotion is most intensely manifested when there is separation and union after separation. So for the devotees of Dwarka, they have been separated from the Lord for very long and now they've come back, now the Lord has come back, they are expressing their gratitude, at the same time they are expressing their sorrow, the Lord was away for so long. And in this was their, their expression, what they say completes and then the Lord responds by glancing lovingly at all of them. So I'll speak this on the broad theme of how Krishna consciousness means to feel the presence of the Lord in his absence. So I'll talk this in three points. First point is how uh, love means there has to be desire but without love, uh, without demanding, demand. Love means desiring without demanding, that's what Prabhupada says. Second point I'll speak is how there is intensity in devotion which comes by the alteration of union and separation. And lastly, I'll talk about how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu embodies that mood briefly. So, the theme is Krishna Consciousness. What does it mean? It means to be conscious of Krishna, as the literal word is, if you look at the meaning. But Krishna Consciousness for us as sadhakas in the material world, it functionally means to feel the presence of Krishna in his absence. Now, we could talk about this at a philosophical level as well as at a personal level. At a philosophical level, Krishna is never absent anywhere. Krishna is Sarvasya Chaham Mruti Sanandini Vishto. He's present in the hearts of everyone at all times. So in that sense, he's always present. But in a personal sense, we may not feel his presence. So when we don't feel his presence, at that time, the, the art, the skill, the practice, the process by which we can start sensing that his presence. That is Krishna consciousness. So, Krishna is always present, but we don't feel his presence. The means by which we can start feeling his presence is the process of Krishna consciousness. So, for us, Krishna consciousness is the process by which we will become conscious of Krishna. Whereas for the pure devotees, Krishna consciousness is their natural default state. Now, in Krishna Consciousness, in the practice or the process of Krishna Consciousness, what exactly is going on? Actually, we as souls are in the material world, our consciousness is caught at the material level and at the material level, there is, there is always the possibility of distress. It can be because of Storms coming out in the outer world, physical or metaphorical. You know, storms can literally come right now. A terrible storm has torn across South Africa. They say it's one of the worst in recorded human history. Millions of people have been rendered homeless. So sometimes terrible storms can come physically, but metaphorically storms can come. That means such things come in our lives that they just shake us up completely. There can be a relationship crisis, there can be a financial upheaval, these are also storms that come in. And correspondingly, when the storms come out, come out externally, come into our lives externally, corresponding to them or independent of them, storms can arise inside us. So, our own desires can grow wild. Mm -hmm. Throughout human history, People have recognized that 
there is something much bigger going on than what we are aware of in our own lives. In the Greek tradition, it would say, be said that uh, it would say that we are the playthings of the gods. Now, we are the playthings of the gods means that the gods can do uh, with us whatever they want, and we just move like playthings. And the idea there's a, there's a god of anger, there's a god of desire, there's a god of envy. We, by here, in that tradition, the word God is used for any higher being. So it could be God, it could be demon also. So suddenly that being possesses us and at one moment we are living normally, next moment we start feeling lusty, angry, greedy. Nowadays, it's a variety of mental health problems, depression, loneliness, low self-esteem. So now there are so many forces inside us which can arise at any moment. It's almost like at a, fun, at a psychological level, we are like a loose unity of many diverse forces within us. And imagine if there's something like a, a closed room. So there, is, there are two people who are talking and one person is outside the room and another person is inside the room. And they're talking. But inside the room there is not one person. Inside the room there are multiple people. And the person, there's a negotiation going on between the two of them. But the person inside and the person outside when they're talking, the person outside is one person, but the person inside, there are five, six people, and to different questions, who responds, you don't know. And say in the negotiation, some person is very conciliatory, another person is very confrontational. So inside that closed box, who will respond at what moment, moment the outside person doesn't know. So all of us are like that black box. And inside us there are multiple voices. The voice of the mind, the voice of the intelligence, the voice of the ego, the voice of lust, of anger. So all these voices are there. And of course, beyond that, the soul is there. So now which voice will respond whom? We don't know. And the less integrated a person is. Integrated means what? There are all these voices inside. But these voices, they negotiate among each other, they discuss among each other, and they present themselves as a united front. The more integrated a person is, the more reliable they can be. That means they have those voices, but they learn to talk among each other, and when they present, it, present a united front outside. Then the person is consistent, but to the extent a person is disintegrated. That means there are too many voices, and any voice can take over at any time then that person can't be reliable. They'll say one thing today and do another thing a few minutes later or a few hours later or a few days later. So the difference between the divine and the demoniac is, in term, is not in terms of the divine are free from lust, anger, greed. But they are relatively, con these are relatively controlled. Whereas in the case of the demoniac, it is the lust, anger, greed that are relatively in control. They're not controlled. So now we have all these forces going on within us and these forces can make us unconscious of Krishna at any moment. Of course there is a force within us which also wants to be conscious of Krishna and there are many forces which want to be unconscious of Krishna. And because for a long time we have listened to the forces that wanted us to be conscious of materialistic things. So right now Krishna consciousness is not our default state of consciousness. Rather, it is material consciousness, the consciousness of wealth, conscious, consciousness of sense pleasure, consciousness of sports, so many other things can be there like that. That is our default consciousness. And then to rise from default, that default consciousness, which is filled with faults, because it keeps us bound in the material world, to rise from there to the level of Krishna consciousness, that is the challenge of the sadhaka. That is the challenge of the sadhaka that we want to, we, because of the various storms that come out externally upon us and the storms that come up internally within us. When one voice takes over, that voice can just dominate us, it can seem like a storm. When a storm comes out externally or, or internally, we become blinded to reality, even physical reality. What to speak of spiritual reality. That's why currently we are not conscious of Krishna. And to become conscious of Krishna 
is the challenge. So while we don't feel the consciousness of Krishna, in the absence of Krishna, how to become conscious of him? That is the challenge which we all face. So in this particular verse, the recipients of Dwarka are saying that, my dear Lord, how can you, how can we live without you? Jeevam te sundara haasa shobitam jeevema. How can we live without seeing your beautiful face, without seeing your beautiful smile? Sundara haasa shobitam, your face, which is adorned by a beautiful smile. So just, so this is they, are saying that how can we live without it? Similarly for us, how can we be conscious of Krishna when there is so much, so many forces pulling us away from that? And the process of sadhana bhakti is meant to gradually acclimatize us towards the consciousness of Krishna. So, prasanna drishtya khila tapa So if somehow we can come in front of Krishna and he glances upon us. This cheerful glance, prasanna drishtya, drishtya is glance, Akhila tapa shoshanam, that it can destroy all distresses. Akhila tapa shoshanam, it can vanquish all distresses in life. So if Krishna's cheerful smile, if it falls on us, then through that his attractiveness will manifest in us. And when that attractiveness manifests in us, our consciousness will get, consciousness will get propelled upwards towards him. So there is a there is a, we could say, a ascending process of Krishna consciousness where we strive to mechanically fix the mind in Krishna. Mind goes here, we bring it back. It goes here, we bring it back. It goes here, we bring it back. That is the ascending process. But there is also a descending process of Krishna consciousness where Krishna reveals his attractiveness to us. Here, normally in the ascending process, we are trying to get attracted. We are trying to fix our mind in Krishna even if we don't find Krishna that, that attractive right now. But that is the ascending process. And the descending process is where Krishna himself reveals his beauty. So when that happens, then we become filled, become immersed in the remembrance of Krishna almost effortlessly. In the Gopal Jampu, these two are called as Smruti and Sphurti. Smruti is what we consciously endeavor to remember. Sphurti is what is like a chain of thoughts that rushes into us, a flood of thoughts that rushes into us and fills us with remembrance of Krishna. So basically this is the first point. Krishna consciousness means to strive to remember Krishna, to feel the presence of Krishna in his absence. So after each point I will have a brief break where any of you want to ask any questions or make any comments, welcome. Any questions or comments in this point? Which one? Okay. So how can we how can we practically apply the principle of feeling the presence of Krishna in his absence? That feeling is not just sentimental, it is spiritual. And that's why it is that we just have to come in the presence of Krishna. In his manifestation, so we read his books, we associate with his devotees, we chant his holy names, we basically place ourselves in the sound vibration surrounding about Krishna. And by that sound vibration, we will gradually become elevated. And that's how eventually we will become purified. So just we, we, even if we don't feel it right now, we just bring ourselves in the presence of Krishna. And by that, just as sugar cane juice becomes sweeter for the jaundice patient by repeated drinking, Similar that will happen. Yes? We were talking about the ascending process and descending process. Yeah. And it seems like the descending process is a lot easier where Krishna himself you know, blesses you so you become effective. So what can we do to get the blessing of Krishna? Okay, so how, what can we do to get the blessings of Krishna so that the descending process? It's ultimately up to Krishna. So we have to show Krishna that we want to be attracted to him. And for many, many lifetimes, we've shown him by our actions that we are attracted to worldly things. That's why uh, even when we show him for a day or two or a few hours or a few weeks, that may not be enough. So we have to consistently, by our actions, keep showing him that we want to be attracted to him. 
and then he will reveal his attractiveness, all attractiveness to us. And of course, it's not that he is not revealed right now. Even now he has revealed, otherwise we are not going to sustain bhakti, sustain asana and bhakti as much as we are doing also. So it's a gradual process. And that, that's why it said the mercy is causeless. So we can't really mm, do anything to cause it. But we can petition. It's like Prabhupada gives the example if somebody is throwing crumbs at ducks, say in a lake. The person may be charitable and may throw crumbs at every all the ducks. But if there are some ducks which quack very loudly, they beg very fervently, then the uh, then the person might give more more crumbs to that duck. So like that if you call out to Krishna more, and calling out doesn't doesn't just mean chanting more loudly. Calling out means we we offer our whole being to Krishna with um, in whatever way we can through our service through our sadhana, whatever. So when we offer ourselves to Krishna more and more, as much as we can, then Krishna sees that and that's our calling. So Krishna's response is reciprocal but not necessarily proportional. It's reciprocal. That means if we, the more intensely we call, the more he will respond. But it's not that I call this much, so Krishna will have to respond this much. It's not, it's not mathematical. It's not, Krishna is not a function of any uh, is not subordinate to any mathematical law. So Krishna sees what is best for our spiritual advancement and just profits accordingly. So let's move on to the second point. The first point is that Krishna consciousness means to feel the presence of Krishna in his absence. The second point is that uh, love is a constant alteration of union and separation. A loving relationship, loving reciprocation is a constant alteration of union and separation. Mm, if we look at the practice of bhakti in the spiritual world, there are also the divine couple, Radha and Krishna, they are not always together. They want to be always together, but circumstantially they can't be. And the times when they are not together, at that time it is Krishna who, it, it is the devotee's longing for Krishna increases, Krishna's longing for the devotee increases. So when there is union, there is great joy. When there is separation, there is great agony. But amid the separation, there is a greater longing that comes up. The love intensifies and then union happens, then there is greater relishing of the union. So although there is a, uh, agony in separation, but even in that separation, there is greater intensification of the remembrance. Krishna, I am not with you. I want to be with you. Please. The devotee begs desperately. And that is of course a very exalted dynamic and I will talk about that tomorrow. But, I am going to class. But today, the point is that even in the spiritual world, the essence is not necessarily Krishna association that is constantly there. It is Krishna consciousness that is constantly there. Even in the spiritual, so in the spiritual world, the big difference with the material and the spiritual world is not that Krishna is 24 hours with everyone in the spiritual world. No, even in the spiritual world, Krishna is not there 24 hours with everyone. Because each devotee has their own service. And according to their service, they get to associate more with Krishna. But at different times, they don't have association. Most of the times. Uh, but what do they have is, that the, everybody over there is very intensely and selflessly Krishna conscious. It's permeated with, the spiritual world is permeated with Krishna centered stimuli completely. And therefore, remembrance of him is uh, not just uh, possible, but it's natural and in inevitable. So both internally the devotees are attracted to Krishna, externally there are various things which attract people to Krishna. So, then also the devotees are Krishna conscious in the sense that they are they feel the presence of Krishna in his absence because internally, externally there are so many stimuli. Now for us as sadhakas, the same dynamic will come. Like when you know, we talked just now about this ascending, descending process of Krishna consciousness. There are some occasions when we feel very strong, very deep, very firm, uh, very, um, very joyous in the practice of Krishna Bhakti. We could say those are the moments when we are having some kind of union with Krishna. Krishna is manifesting 
and we are relishing his presence. And there are some times when we just feel dry and dead in our spiritual life. Even if we are to chant, we can't chant. Even if we are to do some service, we just can't do that service. It's just too difficult. So at that time, when we are overwhelmed like that, we have to see that this is a time when I am in separation from Krishna. Now of course in the spiritual world, it is because of the various nature of services and for the intensification of love that the separation occurs. For us, when we feel distance from Krishna, it may just be because of our own moods influencing us negatively. So we could say that Krishna is above good chakatva, goodness in transcendence. There is the three modes, sattva, rajas, tamas, goodness, passion, ignorance. And when we are in goodness, we can feel Krishna to some extent. But when we are in passion or ignorance, the further and further we go from Krishna. And sometimes it can appear as if we are light years away from Krishna. So when we are in tamas, at that time, we could say that we are having that separation from Krishna. And that separation can make us feel completely empty. So, sometimes when we are in tamas and we are trying to chant or we are trying to do some bhakti and we are not able to connect at all with Krishna, then it might be more helpful to try to come to sattva by some other means. So, what does that mean? That means we can, if you are feeling very sleepy, just get up and let me wash your face. We are feeling sleepy, we are feeling lethargic, that's in tamas. We wash our face and just brush, put some water and wipe it. And what happens? That brings us to a little bit of sattva. Or, if we are, say, we are in, just feeling very sleepy, just stand up or walk. Now walking might not be in sattva. Sitting might be in sattva, but sitting can also be in tamas. Sitting can be in goodness, sitting can also be in ignorance. So walking can bring us in rajas. So rajas is better than tamas. And although Rajas doesn't take us to, in consciousness towards Krishna, but Raj, the mode of passion can at least let us do activities that are connected with Krishna. If I'm just drowsing, what is the use of that? That's, I'm in complete in the, in the mode of ignorance. If I'm, if I'm walking and chanting, I may not be very attentive, but at least I'm chanting. So we could say that there is... Mm, there is... Uh, there is action, there is reflection, and then there is intention, or there is devotion, or attraction. <coughs> attraction. So, the, in the Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, in, in the 13, 14 chapter, in the three modes, he says that each mode has a defining characteristic. It's Prakasha, Pravritti, and Moha. He says in 14.11 that the characteristic of the mode of goodness is Saradvare, Shude, Hesmin. Prakasha upajayate jnanam yadatada vidya viruddham sattva vityuta. So Prakasha is illumination or capacity for reflection. So illumination, clarity. Okay, this is, this is right, this is wrong. This is what will lead to good, this will lead to bad. It's kind of illumination, that is Prakasha, that's goodness. Then in passion is Lobha pravritra arambha karmana mashama spruha rajasyetani jayante viruddha maratarshama this is pravritti. Pravritti is the urge to act. I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do that. The urge to act. Uh, sometimes I, even hyperactivity, that is the characteristic of the mode of passion. And ignorance is aprakasho pravrittischa pramado moha evacha tamasyetani jayante yurdhe kurunandana. In 14.13, Krishna says that aprakasha aprakasha There is no, neither illumination nor action. There is moha, simply illusion. So inaction, no, no clear thinking, no constructive acting, just delusion. So basically the point I'm making is that when we feel separation from Krishna as a sadhaka, that means not feel in the sense that we are longing for Krishna and not feeling his presence, but rather we don't even feel any longing for Krishna. We just, do, we just feel dead and numb internally. <coughs> so at that time, what has happened is our consciousness has gone too much into, into tamas, in the mode of ignorance. And that's why even if we do some, even if we place ourselves in some, some Krishna stimuli, it just doesn't work. We don't f connect with Krishna. So because the distance between ignorance and transcendence can be so big, it can seem light years away. So at that time, somehow, pushing ourselves into some higher mode. So just from coming from tamas to rajas also is good. Just okay, sleeping, just walk. 
and deep breathing is also a way to calm the raging mind by regulating the breath and that can also help in bringing us to sattva so when we come to sattva then we may be able to better connect with krishna but this alteration of feeling down in the dumps and feeling high up in the heavens this is just a normal process of of krishna bhakti wherein we basically it's like a sine wave the when it's when the, when the crest is there we feel high in heavens when it's rough we feel down in the dumps and that's how our consciousness will be but if we keep practicing bhakti steadily gradually what will happen is the amplitude of this the extreme in the crest in the troughs will not be that much and more importantly the overall graph will be moving upwards the crest and troughs will still be there but initially the crest might be such that i might think i am a pure devotee and then the trough might be such that i think does god even exist what am i doing with all this business for but as we keep practicing bhakti the crest will not go so high and the trough will also not go so low so even when we feel some ecstasy we are understand oh krishna is so merciful he is giving me some advanced glimpse of advanced devotion i mean what is i am awaiting me ahead krishna is giving me a glimpse of that we won't think i have become pure devotee but rather krishna has given me a glimpse of krishna is giving me a glimpse of pure devotion so that advanced glimpse will reassure us but it won't uh, disorient us so much into the too much into thinking that we are pure devotees and similarly even when we go down we may not feel like doing anything but it won't be that we will think what is the point of this krishna bhakti we will just think oh krishna i don't want to feel like this please help me so basically uh, the graph will keep moving on upwards and the crest and trough will keep uh, becoming lesser in their extremities that's how we will come to increasing steadiness in our krishna consciousness so rather than seeing the downs as something uh, terrible yes they are unpleasant but they are not unexpected they are not they are just expected as a part of sadhana bhakti and those when we are down in the dumps so now we persevere and eventually that the it's a, it's a just a sign wave that trough will go the trough is not going to stay on forever it's soon going to go so we will experience also this alteration of of ups and downs or union or separation from krishna in our sadhana bhakti stage also so that is the second point that devotion allows means an alteration of feelings of union and separation from krishna any comments or questions about this okay so let's go to the last point now the last point was that if this is embodied by chaitanya mahaprabhu also in his in his past times so where he is is he is krishna in the mood of radha rani so he feels constantly the separation from krishna that even when he was in jagannath puri that he couldn't have darshan jagannath constantly that was his lament he would feel the longing for krishna in his absence and when he would have darshan of jagannath he would become ecstatic when he would be chanting the holy names and he would hear the holy names he would get ecstatically absorbed in krishna so all this is where he is manifesting the joy of union and the agony of separation and something similar is here in this particular past time where it is said that prasan katham vayam nat chiro shite toi oh master how can we live how can we jive how can we maintain our lives when you stay so far away from us so vishnu chakravarti explains that actually because krishna allowed arjuna the pandava so much the mahabharat focuses more on the love between krishna and arjun the bhagavatam focuses more on the dealings between krishna and yudhishthir of course there is arjun also but at least by in terms of etiquette whenever krishna meets he meets yudhishthir first and the bhagavatam describes the remorse of yudhishthir after the war gets over and krishna is consoling him so either way whether it is yudhishthir or arjun at different times different people have different needs so whatever is needed the lord provides them that so he is united with his 
devotees. He uh, is with his devotees, the Pandavas, most of the time, getting them out of trouble or strengthening them, guiding them. And thus, he is not there for the Dwarka verses most of the time. And because of that, they are saying, Oh Lord, how can we maintain your lives? Maintain our lives. Prasanna drishtya akhilata pashoshanam. That prasanna drishtya akhilata pashoshanam. That your glance is so beautiful that all distress can be removed. And interestingly now, I'll conclude this point, that what is the Lord's response to their, their sincere longings? Are they saying that, my, in a sense they are saying it, but they are not directly saying it. They are not saying, oh Lord, don't travel so much. Think about when you, if you travel constantly and you are far away from home, then how will we, how will we be able to live without you? And what does the Lord do? It's interesting, time and time again in the Bhagavatam, when the devotees offer prayers, especially in the first canto, the Lord just does not respond much. Kunti offers such beautiful prayers, just three chapters ago. And what is the Lord's response? This is no response. He offers a beautiful smile and moves on. So, uh, when, you, when somebody is making some request which you don't want to say yes to or no to, just give a smile. If somebody requests, please. <laughs> when somebody requests, please come again. And you don't want to say yes or no, just say Hare Krishna. <laughs> so Hare Krishna can, be a, can mean everything. Whatever we want it to mean. So what the Lord does is, the Lord does not, when Kunti Man is saying that first she says, Oh dear Lord, please don't go without you. How can we live? But then she concludes by saying, actually, the Dwarka Vasas also need you. So she's also, from her side also, she's cognizant. What the Dwarka Vasas are expressing over here, she's also cognizant there that actually we are monopolizing on the Lord's time. And, and yes, they would love to have that time, but we cannot monopolize it. So they say, finally, oh Lord, please cut off my attachments. And let my attachment, even if I don't have your presence always, let me have your presence. Sorry, even if we don't have our pres your presence, let me have attachment to you always. Undistracted attachment to you. And that's a concluding prayer. So similarly, so, so then the Lord just smiles sweetly in response. And he, in a sense, his smile indicates that he accepts their prayers. He accepts their prayers. See, there's a difference between uh, accepting a prayer and answering yes to a prayer. Often we feel that if the Lord doesn't answer yes to our prayers, our prayer itself is worthless. But actually the Lord, the Lord accepts the prayer that itself is a perfection. Because if the Lord accepts our prayer, then that means we are connected with Him. And that connection itself is a form of Krishna consciousness. So the Lord may not necessarily do what we do, what we want them to, him to do, but he will accept our prayer. So there is desiring and demanding. A devotee will also have desires. I want to do this service, I want to do that service, I want to achieve this in Krishna's service, that's fine. A devotee desires, but a devotee does not demand. Prabhupada says in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, in a purport uh, to that Kardamuni section, that a devotee desires to have the of the Lord, but a devotee does not demand the of the Lord. So, simple, so just that expressing that desire through prayer can connect us with him. And the Lord will accept our prayer even if he doesn't answer yes to that prayer. Now in this case, they are saying, oh, without your glance which removes all misery, how can we live? So what is the response of the Lord? He says, Iti chodirita vachaha. He hears all these words which are spoken by the citizens. Prajanam bhakta vatsala. And he is Bhakta Vatsala, the lover of his devotees. And in this case, we are talking about the devotees, the Rajivasi, the Dwarkavasis, for his Praja also. So, Prajanam Bhakta Vatsala, Shurmano Anugraham, Drishtya. He heard it and he became merciful. And what is the mercy? What, how, what form did the mercy take? Drishtya. They had said that without your glance, how can we live? And the Lord responds by offering them his glance. He says, lovingly glances at everyone. Vitanvan pravishatpuram vitanvan. It said he distributed his glance. He glanced at everyone and that's how they all feel enriched. 
and Krishna is in Vrindavan and every evening when he comes back after herding the cows so Krishna and Balram are at the back that all they make sure that all the cows and cows are back uh, and they, they are ahead of them so that they, everyone returns back and Krishna and Balram are at the back at the rear end and then as they enter the village of Raja or the broad area of Raja where the, where the houses and homes are then all the gopis come out in their houses, in the balconies or on the terraces and from there they are beholding Krishna and as they are beholding Krishna now Krishna feels, Krishna feels a little shy to look at the gopis in the presence of Balram because Balram is his older brother so suddenly as Krishna and Balram are walking along Krishna flows down Balram says come on let's go home now you know, we'll, take a, we'll take a bath and Mother Ishuda will have prepared a dinner for us we can go and eat quickly Krishna says, I'm very tired, Balram. You please go ahead. I'll come slowly. And then Balram looks at Krishna and goes, sure? He said, yes. Then Balram rushes off. And as soon as Balram rushes off, Krishna feels liberated. <laughs> and then as Krishna feels liberated, all the gopis, every single gopi Krishna glances at them. Each gopi. And as I said, we are Tanman Pravishat. So, Drishtya Vitanman Drishtya. He distributes his glance to every single gopi. That gopi glances at Krishna and offers her love to Krishna through her glance. And Krishna, by his glance, accepts her glance and her love. And by his glance, he offers his love back to them. And in this way, Krishna reciprocates simply by glances also. So, here, so as Krishna does in Vrindavan, that's what Krishna is doing over here also. He's reciprocating with his devotees by offering them his love through his glances. So they had said, oh, without your, your glance destroys all distress. How can we live without you? So Krishna says, yes, I'll offer my glance to you. Just be enriched by this. So similarly for us, now Krishna may not fulfill. So for them, their specific prayer that Krishna, oh Krishna, don't go away so much, stay with us. That is not fulfilled by Krishna. Krishna will go away again repeatedly. In fact, after some time, Krishna will depart from the world. But although that specific prayer is not fulfilled, their need of being enriched with Krishna consciousness is fulfilled. So similarly for us, and our specific desire within Krishna consciousness may sometimes not be fulfilled. But our desire for Krishna consciousness will be fulfilled. That means that suppose we may desire, okay, I want to distribute books, I want to become a good singer, I want to become a good speaker. All these are good desires and we should have them and try to strengthen them. And sometimes even if that particular desire is not fulfilled, but still through that desire we become conscious of Krishna and Krishna will see our desire for being conscious of him and he will reciprocate by giving us a deepened Krishna consciousness. And that deepened Krishna consciousness is Krishna's ultimate gift to all of us. Ultimately, the most valuable thing in this world is a satisfying object of thought. Our mind works as a generator of all kinds of distracting and destructive thoughts. So if we have a satisfying object of thought, then the mind, which is a thought factory, which is a Thought fact, the mind is a thought factory which is producing con continuously thought factory of the mind is producing useless products. Just like some factories, they produce something main, there's a, there's a finished product which is compared along with that there's a lot of pollution. And sometimes the pollution far outweighs the main product. So similarly for us, our mind, it is meant to do analysis and help us guide it help us function intelligently, but the mind does produces a lot of pollution of unwanted thoughts. And if we have Krishna within our consciousness as a supremely satisfying object of thought, then all other thoughts that are produced by the mind they will be there. And because Krishna is so attractive, we will not dwell on those thoughts. And gradually they will die their own natural death because of our not paying attention to them. The thoughts grow to the extent we pay attention to them. And if you don't pay attention to a thought, the thought will die out. So for us, by the mercy of Krishna, if we become attracted to him, if Krishna manifests within us as a satisfying object of thought, 
that itself will purify us and that itself will elevate and liberate us. So I will summarize. I spoke on the topic today of Krishna consciousness means to feel the presence of Krishna in his absence. First point was how today in this world we face many storms externally that can distract our consciousness and internally we face storms also. It's almost internally we are a composite of multiple personalities and like talking with somebody inside a closed room and there's not one person but there are five people. So who is responding we don't know and all of them speak in the same voice. So they speak the same voice but their mood is completely different. So like that inside us are multiple voices and which one takes over we don't know. So the more integrated we become the more reliable we will be. So because of these multiple voices we become disconnected from Krishna. And sadhana bhakti means that we strive to be conscious of Krishna in his absence. And the second point was to discuss how to do that. But first we understand that this feeling of sometimes being disconnected from Krishna is not unnatural. It is there even in the spiritual world because there also the devotees don't have constant association of Krishna. But they have internally their hearts, they, are, they have lots of attraction for Krishna and externally there are a lot of attractive objects connected with Krishna present. And therefore everyone can remember Krishna very easily. Here often it is because of modes that we feel very distanced from Krishna and deprived of Krishna. But if our chanting is, if, if we are doing bhakti but we are just feeling numb and dead despite our practice of bhakti, then we can try to raise our consciousness from the mode of ignorance towards passion or goodness. And that can be by just washing our face, walking, deep breathing. And then as we raise our consciousness, then we can better connect with Krishna. So, but we rather don't see it as something unnatural. But it's just an alteration. The sine waves will come and go, but over a period of time, their amplitude will not be that extreme and their overall level will be rising. And last point I talked about is how this dynamic of love and separation, that is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gives a gift to us and we desire, but we don't demand. If we desire to be conscious of Krishna, even in a particular way, but don't demand that then Krishna will fulfill our desire in his own way. We will not necessarily get the particular thing we wanted in Krishna Consciousness, but we will get Krishna Consciousness. Just as with Kunti Maharani, Krishna did not respond to her prayer with words, but just smiled at her. And that smile made him enter deeper into her heart. And similarly here, when the Varkas are saying that, Krishna, how can we live without you? Yoglan, Tushtya, Akhila, Tapadu, Shoshanam. So, your glance destroys all distresses and the Lord gives them his glances just as he gave to the gopis in Vrindavan. And thus, when the Lord glances upon us, when we stay connected with him and we receive his mercy, we try the descending process to try to connect with him and sometime he will by the descending process enrich us. When thus enriched, then we will become liberated and liberated. We all need a satisfying object of thought and that is Krishna. Otherwise, our mind is like a tireless thought generator which keeps polluting us with all kinds of unwanted thoughts. So when Krishna manifests as the most satisfying object of thought, then we can neglect other thoughts and connect with Krishna and become absorbed in him. So thank you very much. Any last question? Okay. <coughs> with the prayers of Queen Pinky, like she offered so many verses of prayers and then they just mentioned like Krishna just now and straight after that you just want he just asks Krishna, can you please say it? Krishna says yes. So how come? Why is it for Jewish much? He so very big. Okay. So the Lord did not listen to Kunti's request, but he listened to Yudhishthira's request. Mm. See, ultimately we can't know why the Lord does what, but broadly speaking, we can look at the Acharya's commentaries, we can look at the overall context, and we can infer. So in the case of Kunti Maharani, it was more of a um, more of a emotional separation. Oh, how can we live without him? But that is there for every devotee. But for Yudhishthir Maharaj, it was not just a feeling of separation, but he was himself disconsolate because of the war, because of the casual, because of the enormous bloodshed that had happened because of the war, which he felt 
he was responsible for. And that's why when the Lord stays on, he has a specific purpose to do. What does he do first? Is it the ninth chapter ends with Kunti Maharani's prayers and then Yudhishthira's request, the Lord stays. But then the whole 10th chapter is about Yudhishthira's lamentation and how various people try to, including the Lord, try to pacify him. So no, that's the 8th chapter. And in the 9th chapter, describes how everybody tries to console him, but nobody succeeds, and then they go to Vishnu Pitam. Actually, the 8th chapter also describes that. So basically, the point is that Yudhishthira needs to be pacified. And the Lord serves multiple purposes. The Lord pacifies Yudhishthira, the Lord glorifies Bhishma, and the Lord also is there with Bhishma to, uh, for him to depart in a glorious way. And then he instructs all of us also about the ideal way of departure. So because there is a specific need over there, a gen generic need, every devotee wants association. So for example, if, some, if you want to talk with our spiritual master, he says, I need your association, I need your association, I cannot live without your association. Okay, what do you want? I just, I just need your association. Well, okay, let me come and hear my classes, do some service. But if you have a specific question, if you have a specific issue that you want to deal with, so then the spiritual master or a senior devotee will, will give us time. So Kunti Maharani's prayer is a general prayer of separation from the Lord. There's no specific danger or specific need that is there. And that's why she also concludes, she realized that actually my need is there, but in the cause of need also is there. That's why she says, I just want to be attached to you. Whereas Yudhishthir, although he does not voice that specific need, just by his overall demeanor, it becomes clear that he is he's heavily burdened. And although he has, in a sense, agreed to become the king, but his heart is not in it. So the Lord has to get him to get put his heart into it. And because there's specific service, so the Lord stops. Thank you very much. Shlapupadaki, Pentra, Shilpadaki, Adam, Shilma.